Honestly, I think this might be the easiest video I've ever made. I read five fantastic books in January. Okay, maybe four fantastic books and one that didn't quite work for me, but that I still think it's worth reading. So welcome to my reading wrap up video for January 2022. My name is Juan and before I start, let me remind you that you will find links to all the books I mention in this video in the description box. The links are to the Book Depository, which is an online bookstore that offers free worldwide delivery. And if you buy books using my links, I will receive a small commission, so you will be supporting my channel. Okay, so the first book I read last month was Donna Flor and Her Two Husbands by George Amado. Now, Amado is one of those writers who manages to be both hugely popular and critically acclaimed. He was also incredibly prolific, so making my way through his oeuvre, which I intend to do, uh, will take me a long time to achieve. I've also read his earlier novel, Captains of the Sand, which is a world away uh, from Donna Floor. Do you know how some writers always seem to write the same novel or only do slight variations on their themes? Well, that isn't the case with George Amado. His novel, Donna Floor and Her Two Husbands, first came out in 1966. I read it in the original Portuguese, which only enhanced my reading experience, of course, but like all his other work, it is translated into English and other languages. Now, the novel tells the story of Donna Flor, which at the start of the novel becomes a widow, okay? That happens right at the beginning. Her husband, Vadinho, dies one night during the famous carnival in the Brazilian city of Salvador. Now, through a series of flashbacks, we learn about Donna Flor's early life, her courtship with Vadinho, and their not so happy marriage. Later, Donna Flor uh, remarries, and uh, this time she marries a sensible man named Teodoro, who, unlike Vadinho, is faithful, attentive, but lacks some of Vadinho's, let's say, enthusiasm. Donna Flor has fantasy elements drawn from Afro-Brazilian folklore, but I would be against saying that this novel has elements of magical realism. I think that what Amado is doing here is incorporating Afro-Brazilian beliefs about the afterlife, particularly into this novel. Let's just say that for a while, Donna Flor will have to deal with having two husbands at the same time, okay? I love the sheer exuberance of the writing. The novel is incredibly sensual and it transported me to this very specific place in the northeast of Brazil that I have never been to in my life. I must say though that I wasn't so crazy about some of the fantasy elements later in the novel. I preferred the tone and the content of the earlier sections of the novel. Donna Flor is not a short novel and I felt like some sections dragged a bit. My favorite parts were the ones where we learn about Donna Flor's life up until Vadinho's death. Now, the biggest achievement of this novel, I think, was creating a character like Vadinho, who could be and perhaps should be considered a villain, but ends up being irresistibly charming. I could have done with more scenes with Vadinho in them and fewer involving deities and magic. At its most basic, Donna Flor is about choices and compromises, what we lose and what we gain every time we make a decision. Who would you rather have? Someone like Vadinho, who spices up your life, but cheats, lies and gambles his and your money away? Or someone like Teodoro, who is reliable, sensible, but boring? So the plot of this novel is not that original. Um, how many novels can you name where the protagonist is torn between a nice guy and a bad boy? Probably lots, right? Now, the twist here is that one of the two men is dead. <laughs> I think that Donna Floor and her two husbands is an amazing book and a great suggestion, I think, for anyone interested in Latin American literature in general or specifically Brazilian literature. I recommend it. Next, uh, we have something completely different, which is Hotel du Lac by Anita Bruckner. I've been meaning to get to Hotel du Lac for years, 
early in the life of this channel, you might remember this, I came up with a project that involved reading all the winners of the Booker Prize by decade. And I was looking forward to covering the 1980s so I could read, among others, Hotel du Lac, which won the award, of course, in 1984. Now, if you're a long-term viewer of my videos, uh, you'll, you will know that I abandoned that particular reading project that was very ill-conceived from the start anyway. I'm still interested in reading many novels that won the Booker over the years, but I'm not going to do that systematically decade by decade, okay? That's what I originally, originally thought I would do. Anyway, I finally read Hotel du Lac, which is also the first book by Anita Bruckner that I have read. This novel takes place in a quiet hotel on the shores of Lake Geneva in Switzerland, where an English romance writer, a uh, romance novelist actually, named Edith Hope, meets other English people. One of my problems with this novel is that it is so thin that I read it in almost one sitting, and only a few weeks after reading it, you know, I'm struggling to remember much about it. But anyway, when Edith gets to the hotel, she's in a state over something that has happened to her recently. Gradually, the reader works out what Edith is so confused about, and they also see what happens to her during her stay at the hotel. I was so ready to like this novel and, you know, I had prepared myself for going down an Anita Brugner rabbit hole afterward, but I was so underwhelmed. I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, for the most part, I find Hotel du Lac quite dull, so, you know, perhaps its short length was a blessing. And, you know, another thing is that I did not like the ending. However, I did not have a bad time reading this novel. Despite some of its dullness, I enjoyed some of the humor. That very British brand of cruel humor, you know. Overall, I think Hotel du Lac is an elegant novel, and I can see its appeal. If you would like something very British and short that will not be too demanding or challenging, I would recommend Hotel du Lac. I was tempted to call it um, The Magic Mountain for Idiots, but that would be too cruel and unfair, wouldn't it? The next novel is one I would definitely recommend blankly to everyone. It is A Passage to India by E. M. Foster. If you like E. M. Foster, uh, you need to read A Passage to India. I have read and enjoyed uh, Howard's End, Maurice, and A Room with a View in the past, but for some reason I hadn't managed to read A Passage to India. Now, this novel was originally published in 1924, and it takes place in British India during the 1920s. There are four main characters, three of them are British and one Indian. Dr. Aziz, the Indian character, is a young Muslim doctor whose ideas about British people change when he's falsely accused of attempting to assault an English woman. A Passage to India is about the racial tensions not only between native Indians and their British rulers, but also to a lesser extent, I think, between Hindus and Muslims. Now, this novel's central idea is the impossibility of friendship between Indians and Brits, at least for as long as the latter rule the country. A Passage to India is written from the perspective of a white Englishman, of course, but that to me makes it more remarkable. I would have liked to see more about India at the time in the novel, but the book is only interested in one Indian character, Dr. Aziz, and what are you going to do about that? You're going to find some stereotypes in this novel, but I have the feeling that it is still um, a lot more progressive than what most people in Europe thought about India at the time. Sometimes in the book, uh, India seems to be too mysterious to the point of almost being inscrutable for Westerners, but considering the time it was written, I'm inclined to give Foster a pass. After all, you know, he is sympathetic to Indians in this novel, and I must wonder how many English people were that sympathetic to Indians back then. A Passage to India was one of the classics I wanted to read this year, and I talked about it briefly in that context in a video I made recently. I am glad I read it because I would like to read all the books by Ian Foster I can manage to, and also because, like the ones I have already read by him, I thought A Passage to India was perfectly plotted. 
don't usually read for a plot, you probably know that, but I admire when an author can plot a novel so well as Forster seems to do every time. Next, I have Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant by Anne Tyler. After reading her amazing novel Breathing Lessons last year, I couldn't help but start 2021, uh, no, 2022, with another novel by her. I chose Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant because Anne Tyler has said in the past that it was her favorite novel and because I had tried reading it before and failed. When I first tried to read this novel a few years ago, I just could not gel with the writing. I also couldn't make sense of the story, which was totally my fault because I took so long to read it and took so many breaks that I couldn't even remember the characters' names every time I went back to it. So when I picked it up again last month, I realized that I had read more than half of it. But since I remembered nothing about it except my ascent unsatisfactory reading experience, I decided to start over. And I am here to tell you that I love dinner at the homesick restaurant. I don't know what was wrong with me when I first tried to read it years ago, but it was clearly the wrong time, you know, that happens. Uh, this novel is about the lives of three siblings, Cody, Jessica, and Ezra, who grow up with their mother, Pearl, after their father, Beck, uh, leaves when they are little. The novel spans many decades, from the 1940s to the 70s. We see how the three siblings grow to be very different people and how the same events affect them in different ways. I think most readers will prefer or identify with one of the siblings. The sibling I think I understand best is Cody, but I also like Jessica and Ezra. I don't want to go into the personality of each of the siblings because I think one of the pleasures in reading dinner at the homesick restaurant is seeing where each of the characters is coming from and why they are the way they are. I will talk about their mother Pearl, however, but just to say that she's hands down the worst mother I have seen in fiction. Some of the things she says and does to her children are so unbelievably cruel. Dinner at the homesick restaurant is moving, funny, and affecting, and a lot edgier than any synopses I read made it sound like. I don't think I have to say that I am ready for my next Untyler novel now, which will be The Accidental Tourist, and I hope to read that this month. If I keep responding to Untyler's writing like this, she is a firm candidate to becoming one of my favorite authors. And talking about favorites, last month I finally finished my reread of Swan's Way, which is the first volume of In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. Now, this is, of course, the first part of the French masterpiece, and I feel I should have read the whole thing by now, but anyway, having now read Swan's Way twice, I think that the biggest challenge is not reading it, but talking about it. So the seven volume novel, as you know, is about the narrator's experiences growing up in a French upper class milieu in the early 20th century, okay? Now, this first volume is a recollection of his childhood, which was peopled by different characters, but one of them becomes the protagonist of a whole section of the book. His name is Charles Swan, and he is a young man who frequently visits the narrator's family. Much of the volume is devoted to Swan's uh, love affair with a former courtesan named Odette. Now, I know a lot of people struggle to read In Search of Lost Time, but I also know that a lot of people want to read it. So here's my advice, which may sound silly, but I think, you know, this novel becomes a lot easier to read and even more beautiful if you read it out loud. Hear me out. Even if you're reading it in translation, the sentences are rather long and the prose might unjustly be accused of meandering. But if you find a quiet place for yourself and read it out loud, you will start appreciating it in a whole new way, I think. I read this first volume in French and I intend to do the same with the following volumes. I am sure there are great translations available, but if you have studied French, you might want to try it too. And by the way, if you want my tips on how to start reading books in other languages, here 
Here is a video I made recently in which I share what works for me and how I manage to read whole books in six different languages. Bye.